It's been an extraordinary record-breaking precipitation season here in California. Right here at the Blanco Lirio Global Headquarters back in late February, we had 40 inches of snow on the ground in this picture here. A total of about 60 inches of snow fell. We have 75 inches in the Blanco Lirio rain gauge as of this season, where the average is 50 inches of precipitation. Where is all this water going to go? Let's check it out. Wow. They weren't kidding when they said whiteout conditions. Wow. And the power did go out for over a week here at the Blanco Lirio headquarters. We all huddled near the gas fireplace and brought all the family members in here as it was just too unsafe for them to operate in their houses here in the neighborhood. So now the 1st of April, DWR has conducted their uh, 1st of April snow survey at the Phillips Snow Station. They've got a number of stations throughout the state where they check the snow depth. And here's the results. As of the 7th of April, the Northern Sierra is reporting a 203% of normal snowpack, the Central Sierra 243% of normal, and the Southern Sierra a whopping 306% of normal snowpack. Reservoirs across the state are, for the most part, all at their historical average level, except poor old Trinity Reservoir still lagging behind the rest of the pack. And the major reservoirs that have proper spillway gates are in flood are in the middle of flood control right now maintaining the reservoir level to absorb the runoff from this year's snowpack and the sierra cement is going to run off very slowly even though it's 200 percent of normal and the temperatures are going to get very warm very quick this snow tends to compact and freeze up it's been uh, good cold temperatures this whole time really solidifying that snowpack and will make for a reasonable runoff throughout the spring and summer year quick look at oroville maintaining 860 feet now remember back here they did pop a little bit above their flood control amount but we had a, a an incredible uh, atmospheric river of rain coming in so they allowed that to pop up. They brought it back down to around 856. And now as the flood season gets later and later into the season, they'll slowly bring this water level up to a full pool of 900 feet, which will easily be able to obtain in Oroville this year. Over on Shasta, where they rely more on rainwater than snowpack, they're allowing the reservoir to quickly fill up. Here it is at 1,044 feet with a full pool of 1,067 feet. So it looks like for the first time in many years, Shasta Reservoir, run by the Army Corps of Engineers, will be full. Here's what Oroville looked like just yesterday, flying over in the Husky. Outflow of the spillway, only about 6,000 CFS. Inflows, only about 12,000 or so CFS as that snow slowly melts. Orville Reservoir is part of the State Water Project run by the Department of Water Resources and is part of the system that moves water all the way from Northern California to Southern California via the California Aqueduct. So if we go to the California Nevada River Forecast Center, currently most of the rivers, all of the rivers in the North State are looking good for flood control because we've got the major reservoirs doing flood control and the snowpack is melting will be melting off at a reasonable rate what is shown here is problems in the southern san joaquin valley in the san joaquin river and merced river the area we want to focus on for flooding potential is down here in the southern san joaquin valley and i'm beginning to learn a lot more about how this system works down here let's check it out where the snowpack is the highest this year in the southern sierra nevada mountains upwards of 300 percent unfortunately the reservoirs are the smallest these reservoirs pine flat terminus schaefer and isabella are all relatively small reservoirs with without proper spillway gates these reservoirs simply 
fill up to a spillway to the top of the spillway and the water just flows over in an uncontrolled fashion so this water is eventually going to work its way into and reform the old historic Tulare Lake. And this is the best way to manage this water here in the southern San Joaquin Valley, is to go ahead and reflood the historic Tulare Lake. Of course, Tulare Lake was deflooded in the late 1800s and turned into farmland. So acres and acres of farmland are going to be flooded and not be able to be used at all during this whole growing season. If we zoom in on Google Earth here, San Joaquin Valley that provides food and produce for the entire world, down here, just west of Corcoran, you can see the outline of the historic Tulare Lake Bed, which was at one time the single largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi River. In the days of yore, you could take a steamship from San Francisco all the way down the San Joaquin River into the Tulare Lake. Waterways feeding the Tulare Lake, which have always fed the historic Tulare Lake, include the Kings River up north, St. John's Creek, Cross Creek, the Cahuilla River, Elk Creek Bayou Outside Creek, the Thule River, which comes out of Schaefer Dam from Lake Success, Mill Creek, Deer Creek, White River, and Poso Creek. Now, while flying back from my commute flight from Los Angeles back to Sacramento after my last Sydney trip, I was able to get a seat in the back left side of the Southwest 737, thank you Southwest, and get some good views of Tulare Lake from about 30 some odd thousand feet. So these brown fields here are fields that they are allowing to lie fallow in anticipation of the flooding. And here we can begin to see the flooding of Tulare Lake. So right here is Corcoran Prison. Here's the town of Corcoran. Here's the Thule River coming into Tulare Lake. And right about in here on the Tulare River is where they popped about a hundred yard wide. There's that lonesome barn that everybody always focuses on in the media. They popped open a hundred yard wide portion of the levee to begin to flood Tulare Lake and take the pressure off of the Tulare River. Here we are located on the... Uh, map just east of Corcoran. So we're talking about this area right here, just south of Lemoore Naval Air Station and just um, to the west of Corcoran is this Tulare Lake. There's Corcoran, there's the prison. And I-5, isn't that I-5 right there? Or is I-5 over? I-5 is over here. That would be 99 going through Corcoran. That's right, they're going to let all these crops lie fallow and eventually plan on flooding this portion. And they've got a levee. Hopefully they've got a good levee around the town, the towns down there, Corcoran and that state prison. Up here on the north end is where the Kings River comes in. My flying buddy Jeff Martin, who lives down there in the Bakersfield area, got some pictures from his Cetabria flying lower over to Larry Lake for a fairly current view of the flooding. It looks like they've planted some tree crops in here that are going to get flooded as well. Of course, this will go a long way also towards groundwater recharging. Here's a great satellite app I just discovered, the Sentinel Hub. This is the Sentinel-2, and you can choose any number of satellites and get a very current view. This is of the 1st of April. First off, take a look at that good snowpack in the, in the High Sierra. That is our number one reservoir, our number one water storage method here in the state of California. And here we can zoom in and get a good look at the flooding of the Tulare Lake, how we're only partially flooded so far, and we've got a long way to go. They've got a lot of room to store water here in, the, if you look at the whole outline of the historic Tulare Lake, the recently historic Tulare Lake. Years ago, hundreds of years ago, it was much larger.
And again, there's all those fallow fields that are not being planted and planned on being flooded. Now, there's a bit of a controversy somewhere down here in the south end of Tulare Lake. I believe they're importing sludge from Southern California. I'm not sure which part it is, if it's here, here, or here, but there better be good levees separating that from the rest of the water because this Tulare Lake water is usable water. There are a couple of schemes of moving water out of Tulare Lake rather than just letting it sit and percolate on in. One is if the water level is high enough, you can move this water north into the San Joaquin River, but that provides additional pressure and flooding potential for those communities along the San Joaquin River. Another option to relieve the pressure from the flooding here in the southern San Joaquin Valley is a relatively unheard of thing called the Kern River Intertie. Let's check that out. The Kern River, the farthest river south in the San Joaquin Valley, headwaters way up here by Mount Whitney, comes down into Lake Isabella, which they've done a lot of work on the dam and spillway system there. See the previous update. And then pours again out of a spillway without spillway gates just pours over the top of the spillway on down the Kern River towards Bakersfield and traditionally well historically it went right into the Tulare the historic Tulare Lake today it um, comes into Buena Vista Lake and Kern Lake kind of a, a like Tulare Lake or maybe a portion of the old old historic Tulare Lake bed these are basically dry lake beds that flood during flood season. Through a series of sloughs and um, other canals, this water can drain on up into Tulare Lake today. Now, the interesting thing that they have here at the end of the Kern River where it ties or nearly touches the California aqueduct system is the Kern River intertie. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is, just north of Highway 119. Here's the California Aqueduct, and here's the end of the Kern River, and it can tie into, via this concrete structure here, you can pour water from the Kern River during flood years into the California Aqueduct and add it to the state water project. The issue is now, well, let's go take a look at that uh, satellite view and see where it's at today. As of today, it looks like the Kern River or Kern Lake and um, Buena Vista Lake are not flooding. This photograph is as of a couple days ago, satellite view. But as we zoom in here to the inner tie, it looks like this area is flooding at the time, at the current time. There is water here that could be moved if needed into the state water project or California aqueduct. So the question is now is, uh, is what's the debate going on down there? Is, does somebody want to get paid for the excess of water rights to move it into the aqueduct system? What's the hang up here? Interesting bit of local water politics going on here at the Kern River inner tie. But this could be used to reduce the pressure of the water coming out of the Kern River. Now, a lot of different private enterprises and ranches are very excited this year to finally get their groundwater recharge systems working. They're moving water, relieving floodwaters, and going ahead and flooding farmlands in an effort to recharge the aquifer underneath the farmlands, where they can use that water in the future by pumping it back up and out. There they are moving the water into and flooding the farmlands. So while I don't know how damaging it is to those trees there, it, but other crops cannot be grown during the time that they're flooding the fields. But so in the short term, you're losing money, but in the long term, you're gaining water. There's another interesting groundwater recharge story going on in Southern California. Remember in the state water project where we're moving water all the way down to Southern California via the California aqueduct into Pyramid Lake and Castaic Lake. The Santa Clara River right here 
is hoping to capture some of this water for ground recharging. If there's enough excess water out of Lake Piru, it'll pour out of Piru Lake into the Piru Creek and into the Santa Clara River. And somewhere along here, they're able to flood some of this, I presume some of this farmland or some of this area for groundwater recharging. The catch is <laughs> the cost of pumping the water up over the Tehachapi Mountains. Who's going to pay for or how do you recapture the cost of moving that water, pumping that water up over the mountains and then into Piru and then downhill into the Santa Clara River? The, the idea of the State Water Project was to have a series of hydroelectric dams along the way, including the Orville After Bay area, to generate electricity to help offset the costs of pumping the water up and over at the Tehachapi Mountains and into Southern California. So it'll be interesting to see how things are going with the Santa Clara Water Recharge Project along the Santa Clara River. And it looks like we're going to get one last shot at a at an above water ground storage project here near Sites, California, up in Northern California, where they want to build the Sites Dam and inundate this valley here and pump the water in and out of the canal system to, to create the Sites Above Ground Reservoir. And here's what the plan looks like, Sites Reservoir here We've got the Glen Calusa Canal and the Tehama Calusa Canal. Both of these come out of the Sacramento River just to the north of here. And there they can run a series of pump stations and pump the water up to and store it in the site's reservoir and then use it when needed, especially during times of drought. Bring that water back down and reintroduce it into the whole California water project. So it's been an extraordinary water year here for California. What we do to preserve and manage this water is a long and complicated story. Stay tuned. We're learning a lot here on this channel. Thank you so much for your support, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.